Hi skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Uh, Bob and I are back for our next 2021 men's ski comparison video. This is a big one, you know, maybe yeah. arguably the biggest or like the most popular category of skis. So I know this is one that you guys have been waiting for. Uh, we do have a few more to do after this, you know, we're, we're hoping to do like a specific twin tip comparison and then powder skis and mm -hmm. then probably some touring equipment too. So, yeah. doing more of these comparisons this year than ever before. Hope you guys are enjoying the, you know, more more detailed breakdown. Or I think we're like narrowing in more on on little yeah. little groups of skis, which I think is fun. There's still so much variety, even with. I mean, we have 20 skis here. There's just still so much variety, even within yeah. this group. It's just it's impressive. Yeah. No, a lot of different stuff in this group. I, I'm pretty. I'm looking forward to doing this one. Um, so. We'll just get right into it, Bob. Why don't you kick us off over here with this Kessley FX96HP. All and right. a quick note, we are going most expensive to least expensive in this. Yeah. Uh, the, the opposite of the last video. So, $1,099, just shy of $1,100 here for the Kessley FX96HP. Um, this ski is unchanged from last year, so if, you know if you heard about it last year, it's the same for this year. Uh, Kesley does some cool stuff with this. So this midsection here of the ski um, is made out of poplar and paulonia wood, and that whole thing is wrapped in like a fiberglass and carbon stringer sock. Um, and then on the outside edges of the ski is a poplar and beech uh, wood stringer. So they really use different woods yep. in their ski to create a different feel. So on the outside with that beach, you know, it's a little stiffer, so it's going to give you more control over the edge. Uh, but that central sock, I mean, I call it a sock. I, don't I think, think that's a good way to describe sock, it. I think yeah, that, that like, communicates the, the visual of right. what's going on in yeah. there. The wood core is stuffed in a sock. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, with that... Uh, carbon and fiberglass in the middle that is taking the place of the metal that used to be involved in these HP skis. So really, I mean, I would say from like here back, we're dealing with a very stiff, stable, precise ski. Yep. Uh, from here forward, the shovel into the tip, you know, this huge hollow tech, uh, very light and pretty, pretty flexible in the front here. Yep. So that's going to give you the soft snow performance. Um, and then throughout the rest of the ski, uh, very much precise, um, you know, just really well-rounded ski. Not a whole lot of taper in the tail here, so it's going to want to hold on to the turn, but there is some rocker built in, so that's going to help you release in a little bit of the playfulness going on with that ski. Um, but you just get that Kessley quality, you know, for that price tag. Um, you know, everyone who gets on this thing really notices right away the fit and finish. Uh, the precision involved and just just how accurate of a ski it is and how well it responds to your input. So that's really what you're paying for. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, they, they feel great. I always like to think about the older versions of the FX skis. Yeah. Because um, they did change quite a bit when they went to this. The older versions used like a bunch of metal. Yep. Which kind of like didn't really make sense for what they were as skis that are kind of designed for potential backcountry touring use. You know, they're they're kind of like adventure-oriented yeah. skis. You know, Chris Davenport spends a ton of time on these. And when I first tested these, which was, was a, a while ago at this point, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, you know, how are they going to retain its power yeah. and stability? And they basically did, did so with its shape. Yeah. You know, there's like more of a, a flatter, squared-off tail than ever before. So it kind of retains that stability and the, the precision that the old FX skis had, but they're much lighter now, yeah. which I think just like makes them more versatile in general. Yeah, definitely quicker and, and yeah. you know, better for more skiers. I think it was kind of pigeonholed right. that old one towards you know, a pretty high end. Skier. Yeah, like there were in that old FX line, you know, I often would like hold an FX in one hand and an MX in the other hand. Mm -hmm. I was like, these things are pretty similar. Yeah. Um, whereas this really sets itself right. apart from that MX line now. Um, next up is another in the 1099 price range. So just shy of $1,100, just like the Kessley. Not surprising because it's a Stokely. You know, usually Stokely and Kessley are pretty much right there in the same same price point. Yeah. Um, this is a, a fantastic ski. 
a little bit more stability and vibration damping in this ski compared to that FX96. You know, I, I don't think it's quite as capable as like a touring ski, mm -hmm. but you get more of that that super, super smooth feel. Um, Stokely uses this metal top sheet. The core itself is actually pretty darn light, yeah. which, which makes the whole ski really light. You know, we're going to talk about, moving down the wall here, we're going to talk about a lot of skis with a lot of metal that are powerful and stable and really good vibration damping or very, very stiff. This, what's cool about this ski is it pretty much can match or surpass, in some cases, the performance of those skis, but it does it with a lighter feel. Um, and a little bit of a softer flex pattern. It's still pretty darn stiff and, and very springy and responsive, but I do feel like you get a little bit more like compliance out of this right. ski compared to like a bona fide 97. Yeah. And probably, you know, I, I mentioned in the women's comparison that we just did that I don't really like to throw out superlatives ever. You know, I feel like things like that are, are a little bit too subjective to right. be putting in, into a ski discussion. But I do think it's fair to say that this is probably the smoothest feeling ski up here. Yeah. You know, there are some skis close to it, but this thing just, it just feels so smooth. Yeah. Unbelievable ski. Yeah, really. And just, you know, the lack of taper in the tail, you know, speaks to that more on-trail carving personality. Yeah. And I always say about these Stokely's is that you don't have to get them up to about 40 miles an hour to right. really access all the performance. Um, you know, and we'll probably say that about the Bonafide when we get there, is that that one does have to go fast. Whereas right. this, you know, use the word compliance, and I think that's a good one for this ski, is that it does, it is able to, you know, access the side cut and the flex at lower speeds. Yeah, you take that first turn right as you're getting off the lift and like right away they feel great. Yep. Instead of some skis, you take that first turn off the lift yep. and then you just have to go straight for like 100 yards and then start skiing. Right. This you can ski right away. Yep. I think that's a good way to think about it at least. More turns per dollar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like you're more swings per dollar in, in your in golf, golf analysis. Yeah. I mean, why do I want to get a low score? I'm just wasting money. Um, we got a line blade this year. Uh, this is a new ski for line. Such a cool ski. Such a cool ski. I was looking at this wall last night and and thought to myself, well, out of all the out of all the skis on this wall, I've actually put the most time in on this. I gave this a pretty solid four day run uh, this past winter. Uh, really, just kind of wanted to get a sense for what it could do and what it was capable of, uh, because it is so different than everything else that we see come through here. Yeah. Um, so just a quick note on construction, uh, we got a wood core and then we have um, this metal technology. Uh, I'm totally blanking on the name, it's, it's one of those interesting names. Yeah, you know, it's um, funny because gas, pedal, gas metal. pedal metal, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say spring, spring, spring blade, blade, but that's the yeah. uh, one we're getting down to the menace. So gas pedal metal here, so we ha basically have like this, it's kind of like a curtain drain type of shape where the central cord of metal comes up and then feeds off to the sides here. Um, so obviously the thing that stands out about this is the tip shape, um, you know, 150 yeah, millimeter, yeah. I think, 95, That actually made this foot. side of the wall go further to the wall yeah. because the tip of the blade is so big. So they need to put this metal here to make it torsionally stiff enough for you to actually get the thing up on edge. I mean, you have to really create a high edge angle to get this to, to carve. Um, and then the tail shape is also very interesting. It's like a mini swallow tail, yeah. um, kind of like a, you know a miniature version of what we see on the Pescado or the Sakana. Um, and then it does have you know, a twin tip rocker. I'm not sure exactly what where to draw the line there, but it unique tail rise. Unique Let's tail just call rise. It that. I like it. So um, it does release from the turn easier. It yeah. doesn't lock you in. My initial uh, impression was that this was a wide slalom ski. You know, it has that dramatic side cut. They're calling, their, they're calling the turn radius short. Um, also like 15 meters we see thrown around. Um, so you do need to get it up on edge to create that, uh, that short arc. Um, but I really wanted to get a feel for it like in the woods and in the softer snow. Unfortunately, we got some of that. Um, and you know, for how wide it is, not too bad, like yeah. in the bumps in the trees. You can yeah. definitely maneuver this thing pretty well. Uh, and then when you pop out on the groomers, you're on just this amazing carving ski that you can really just get 
get on edge. Uh, just a really impressive ski, um, you know, kind of a throwback to what we've seen from like a Solomon BBR. Um, yeah. Kind of throws back to... Icelandic Shaman. Yeah, that's that? another ski, one we heard yeah. of. Um, and just, a, you know, a really unique ski and, and very interesting. Well, this is a 176. It also comes in a 181. I did not get to ski the 181. Yeah, I think that would be um, your size. I would like to try it. But even so, like, I didn't really go over the handlebars too much on this thing once. Yeah. But <laughs> not as much as I thought I was going to. Um, but just a really cool ski from Line and, you know, certainly worth worth a try. Right. There's so many of these skis that, especially in this category, and, like, we're going to kind of be saying this in the next few skis here, so many of these, like, kind of focus on carving performance yeah. or want to retain carving performance while still feeling like a versatile all-mountain ski. Yeah. This, is, this does it, too. It just does it in, like, such a different way than right. anything else. Like, it does have that, like, slalom feel when you're at a high edge angle and, and you give it that input but then yeah it's like it, you can slash it and smear it yep. and like do all sorts of kind of like modern free ridey things on it which i think when you look at it and when i first saw this ski those are things i didn't expect yeah um, so it, it's cool it's it, it's pretty darn unique but it's a lot of fun to ski and we've actually had a lot of people leaving comments or reaching out to us directly thinking about or having already chosen that ski as yeah. like a replacement for like multiple skis yeah. because it can do so many different yep. things. Um, next up is a pretty heavy hitter in this category in uh, two senses of that of that phrase. Uh, it's, it's pretty heavy. Yep. It's probably the heaviest ski that we've looked at so far and it's also a really popular one too. Very, very well known, pretty strong following in this Blizzard Bonafide. Um, it's now the Bonafide 97, so the shape has changed a little bit. It's a little bit narrower. They also gave us more lengths, so there's a smaller difference in each of the lengths and one extra, yep. so a little easier to kind of hone in on, on what works best from you. This is the 177, which I will say is awfully close to the 180 of the previous version ski in length. Um, so, you know, take a three millimeter difference isn't much anyways or a three centimeter yeah. difference isn't much anyways so kind of keep that in mind 177 isn't dropping down that much in length um, and then they changed this ski quite a bit in its construction so still two sheets of metal and there's actually one extra sheet of metal underfoot uh, which is pretty darn interesting um, and then they also used their new true blend wood core so that's kind of a key element to the different lengths now is each length has a different mock-up of this true blend wood core so it's less dense wood throughout the whole core and then there's little strips of denser wood that are kind of strategically positioned depending on length to really like give it its proper flex pattern so the longer skis are stiffer than the shorter skis and noticeably so yeah. i know you guys had a, a test day while i still had a broken collarbone where you were each skiing multiple different lengths back to yeah. back and I know you could really kind of feel the difference between those um, but overall this thing is still it's still the bona fide that it's always been it's really powerful it's probably one of the stiffest skis up here still um, incredibly good vibration damping it's endless speed limit but it is one of those skis that kind of has a minimum speed right. you know you do kind of have to get it up to a certain speed or, or give it a certain amount of skier input to get it to perform the way you want it to. Um, it's never been one of the more forgiving or versatile skis in this category, but they did up that versatility and the forgiveness a little bit. The tips and tails are just a little bit softer flexing than they ever have been before, although they took out some rockers, so you still get the precision and the responsiveness that you always got. Just you know, going back to that word compliance, you get a little bit more tip and tail yeah. compliance. And like you said, I had the 183 on and then the 189. Yeah. And, you know, I Im immediately took to the 189. Yep. The 183 felt a little twitchy for me. Um, but, like, going back to the older one, I, I felt like the 183 skied more like the 187 yep. of the old one. And the 189 was just a totally different ski. Cool. Um, so it is interesting to see that there is a difference. Um, 
you know, I don't want to make a blanket statement and say that people should size up if they're in between, but yeah, I don't I think would. that's I don't think that's fair to make a blanket statement because I'm not sure I would. Right. For example, like I previously usually skied the 180. I think I might go to this 177 now. Yeah. Just because I'm super light. And like I'd get a little bit more versatility out of this, and I don't think I would need the extra stiffness right. of the 183. So definitely a decision-making process to be to be done if you're choosing this ski. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to us because pretty much like most people in our staff at this point have skied this ski in multiple different lengths, so we can kind of attest to your specific size right. and ability and, and try and help you help you choose a length. Uh, yeah, and adding that extra length does make it does make it more. Yeah, more people are going to find what they're looking for in that. Thing. Exactly. Yeah, so. definitely. Uh, moving back to the less metal or no metal, uh, we have a Black Crow's Camo. Oh, and for price, we oh. went to in the blade. We went to seven fifty. Yep. And now we're in the uh, six ninety nine range, I believe, and we're we're stuck in the six ninety nine range here for, for the next bit. the next few skis. Um, this is an interesting one. Black Crows is cool because they don't really make a series of skis. They make individual skis. So when we see like a Bonafide or an Enforcer that have counterparts of wider or narrower, uh, Black Crows does not do that. So the Camex is a unique ski. Uh, this is their 97 millimeter underfoot uh, sort of twin tip. Um, I would say it's more of a turned up tail um, versus a twin tip, but yep. certainly there's a freestyle application to be had on this thing. Um, the other thing that they do that's interesting is kind of the semi sidewall cap. So vertical sidewall underfoot, tapering to half cap uh, in the tips and tails. So that's going to make it lighter and more maneuverable. Uh, the other interesting thing about this ski is its amount of positive camber. So it really has a good amount of positive camber. You get a ton of snap out of the turn. Um, you know, that was my first impression, you know, three turns in when we skied this yep. thing last year was, wow, what a great amount of energy for a ski like this. Um, and, and really fun, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to snap in and out of the turns, whether you're on groomers in the bumps or in the trees, um, you're going to get more quickness than this 97 millimeter waist would otherwise indicate. Yeah. Um, you know, not a ton of rocker built in, so it's definitely... Um, you know, will do that softer snow, but I thought it had better application more on trail and in, you know, more packed snow versus fresh snow. So kind of a nod to that, uh, that freestyle influence as well. But you just get a ton of energy out of this thing, and it's really impressive. Yeah, and I found it to be pretty reasonably versatile, too. Yeah. You know, you, you, you were talking there about firm snow. I do think there's, like, enough rise in the tail. Sorry about that light. Um, there's enough rise in the tail that you, especially if you kind of have this skiing style, you can get it to kind of smear and yeah. release and, and play. Like, I had a lot of fun skiing this thing, um, you know, with, with a freestyle background. I think I actually moved the demo binding up, like, a little bit and mm -hmm. made it a little bit more center-mounted, which you really wouldn't want to do drastically because, you know, that, that increased sidewall is, like, pushed back it's right. not in the center of the ski so it's really not like a, a park design but there's definitely some freestyle influence in it like I was skiing at switch and, and you know doing the normal weird stuff that I would like to do on skis and yep. I had a lot of fun on this because I felt like I could ski it pretty aggressively and pretty hard and still play and have fun and like do the things that, that I like yeah. to do on skis um, and yeah, this is actually 720. I think I said we were in 699 at this point. Bonafide dropped down to 750, pretty sure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the prices on okay. the actual video <laughs> just so we don't have to get them wrong. Um, I do know with the Enforcer 94, we're, we're in the 699 range. Um, and this is a new ski for 2021 as well. We've actually talked about a lot of new skis so far. A couple of them carried over from last year, but this is one that's new. Um, they basically took that Enforcer 93 and tweaked it a little bit, similarly to how Blizzard tweaked the Bonafide. So we get one extra length, those lengths are closer together, yep. so it's a little easier to choose your size now. I have a 179 here, so that's like a really good example again. like. In the Enforcer 93, I kind of felt like I was in between 177 and 185. This 179 is like perfect for yeah. me. Um, so just a little bit easier to kind of hone in on what length works for you. 
Um, pretty classic enforcer, two sheets of metal, wood core, that did take the construction and the technology that exists or existed in the 88 and the 104 and carried it over to this ski as well as the 100, which also changed a little bit. We talked about that before. So a little bit more, or a, a lighter tip rather, mm -hmm. and then they put some carbon fiber reinforcements through the ski too. So they basically took the weight down a little bit, especially in the tip, so the swing weight is, is more noticeably or more noticeable than the overall weight. And you know, in my hand, it's still a pretty heavy ski, yep. but I do think it feels lighter on your feet. They also changed the tip profile. Um, so you get a little bit quicker engagement. And I think overall, the changes to this ski, it's still versatile, but I do think it feels a little more powerful now. Like just in, in like raw, power firm snow application yeah it's it they took a little bit of the performance that exists in the 88 and put it into this ski um you know it, it's right up there like this is a classic comparison people ask about these two skis all the time pretty darn similar in like overall power stability vibration damping that kind of stuff i feel like the bona fide is a little more precise because you get a longer effective edge less rocker and this is a little more drifty, smeary, yeah. um, a little bit more forgiveness in softer snow conditions. Basically due to this tip shape and, and the tail as well, just the way that Nordica kind of rounds out the tips and tails of these skis and, and includes a little bit more rocker than we see on some of these other skis. Like I, I could have put the, uh, put the mantra right up there too, in, instead yeah. of the bona fide and kind of the same conversation there. Um, so, a lot of power, a lot of stability, a lot of vibration damping, no speed limit whatsoever. Yeah. Um, it does require a little speed to, to get it to perform, but I don't think it, it's quite as demanding as the Bonafide in that sense. Yeah, and my initial impression and ultimate takeaway of that ski, I have two actually. One is that it really makes any turn at any time. I mean, there's just nothing, there's nothing that it can't do. Um, so, it, it, and that's kind of where the ski is supposed to sit. Um, and then the other thing is like with the Enforcer series, like this could be the only Enforcer or they could remove it completely. <laughs> you know, like it, sure. it does no, it everything, yeah. but there's also like the other Enforcers are so good too. But uh, you know, this thing just, it holds an edge well. We're going to see a lot of these at Stowe this year. I mean, yeah, we see definitely. the 93s here for a long time. Yeah, but especially um, for Stowe application, like yeah. this 94 is better than right. the 93. Just right. a little bit more firm snow performance, yeah. which is important here. And then, you know, bar, we can kind of transition to the mantra with this one if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's put them both up here. Might as well just do that one. Um, you know, I notice on the wall where the rocker profiles lie, and it's hard to see uh, from your perspective, but this enforcer is sitting about an inch back towards the wall more than the mantra. Yeah. And it is a little shorter, but I think that e even if we have the same lengths, it would do the same thing. Um, and that's giving this mantra more of an on-trail, uh, precise element to it. Yeah. So it's not gonna, it's not as drifty, especially in the in the tip, um, you know, and that's kind of a nod to where vocals coming from in terms of their, you know, on trail uh, priority. Um, so between those two skis, and we hear this a lot, you know, like which one's better for carving? Right. You know, I would say the mantra is slightly better at carving because it has less tip rocker. Yeah. It's gonna hook up onto the snow sooner. Um, Titanal frame in this build here, so carried forward from last year. Uh, and it's just a really stiff ski, a lot of metal to it. I love the sound of that one, very plinky. Um, and, you know, we've just seen so many people just love this ski over the years. 96 underfoot, um, so if you're kind of used to that older mantra, the, you know, either 98 through 100, uh, this one is a little bit narrower. We've talked extensively about the mantra 102 um, and how that's kind of a more natural transition from a skier on the older versions of the mantra. But, like, you know, this is one of those true 50 50 skis. Um, you know, go anywhere, do anything type of thing. Uh, just a little bit more precise on trail, a little bit more edge grip uh, versus the Nordica, um, and especially shovel forward. Yep. So that's where we're seeing the big difference there. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's I, like it's kind of a cop out to say this, but it's it's just got that classic vocal feel. Right. Vocal skis always have this combination of being like stable and and powerful, but also very precise. Yeah. Like I think the precision is something that's that's a, a real vocal quality, yeah. and it definitely exists in this M5 mantra. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's a it's a fantastic ski, and I definitely think I think you're right in the sense that like if you're if you as a skier have a lot of emphasis on carving, the mantra is one of the best choices. Yeah. Period. And you, and you still get versatility out of it too. Um, yeah, it's know. just not quite the floater in the soft snow that. No. You know the enforcer, uh, enforcer, or even the you know the Stokely. Uh, yeah, but I think a lot of skiers are a fair amount of skiers are, are willing to make that sacrifice yep. and they value the precision more. Yep. And the you know the power through crud. I mean we could talk about it with the bona fide as well. It's just absolutely blast through the stuff. Yeah. Not much of a dancer, but more of a more a of plow. a plow. Yeah. Uh, so next gear we're going to talk about is actually quite similar to the M5 Mantra, and as we did with the past couple of skis, I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do with these as well as make a direct comparison here. There's a lot of similarities going on between these two skis. You know, we, we've talked about it with the 90 comparison. We talked about it with the 100 comparison. Yeah. Same story with this, with this mid-90 comparison here. Um, so they use very, very similar construction techniques. There's two sheets of metal in the ski. They call it twin frame technology. Um, so two sheets of metal, and then the top sheet of metal has basically these windows removed. So much like they're doing with Titanal Frame, where they're taking the metal out through the middle of the ski, Solomon's doing that too. They're just leaving more metal. Um, so this ski gets a little bit more vibration damping, it does feel a little heavier in my hands, and that's one of the things that makes that M5 Mantra so responsive and precise is it is a little bit lighter than some of these other skis. The stance also uses a little bit more rocker, um, both in the tips and tails, you know, a little bit more taper through the tail as well. You know, it's not quite like an enforcer tail, but I do find more forgiveness out of this tail. You know, the rocker is like not drastically different, but you do get a little bit more rise out of that stance. And I think that's important. Um, it's a little bit, it's, it's more emphasized when we get up to the 100 category, when you look at the Mantra 102 versus the Stance 102, because the Stance 102 uses a lot of rocker. But there's more rocker in this than the Mantra. Yes. So if you're kind of looking for that, almost two full sheets of metal, you know, I think actually a reasonable way to think about this ski is it kind of falls somewhere in between the Mantra and the Enforcer. Yep. Because it's not quite Enforcer flex pattern, um, and it's not quite Enforcer tip shape or rocker profile, but you get a little bit more versatility or, or soft snow kind of surfiness out of this ski, and still just plenty of stiffness. Yep. Um, you guys had a great test day on these yeah. skis, and there's there's some pictures of Bob laying over some real nice turns on these these stance 96s. Yeah, that thing rips, and I you know they make it in the 188, so you know a nice length for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just blown away from the first turn, like how stable and damp it was. Um, you know, and they in those windows they're putting in their CFX material. Yeah which just has a different feel than like the metal of the mantra. Right. So, you know, I'm always saying it has a more woody feel versus a more metallic feel. And this one falls on the woody side of things it's versus the mantra, which is more metallic. So, you know, it's just a different feel and a different preference for skiers. Um, you know, I tend to fall more on the woody side of preference um, and just really enjoy the, you know, the overall dampness of that of that stance um, in, in, all, in all widths. But I, I, I really thought that 96 was a, you know, a good one for, for really versatile skiing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's cool that we have all these options now. I'm just gonna cover up the Kamex with the Bonafide because the Kamex isn't really one that falls into this. But these four skis right here all use a lot of metal. They all are very powerful. Yeah. There's no performance ceiling. You know, nope. best skier in the world can ski all these, and it's going to live up to their expectations. 
but there's just just subtle differences between all four of them, which I think yeah. is really cool and really lets you kind of hone in on, on what makes most sense for you as a skier. And we can put this one in there too in terms of how they're built. Um, the yeah. Atomic Vantage 97 Ti um, uses a similar frame style. They call it ProLite, um, and basically they're building from the ground, from the snow up, um, and eliminating the need for um, this material here. So think about the stance and the and the mantra, and how they are, uh, you know, reducing the amount of material, or at least the the metal material in the middle, and the Atomic does the same thing. Um, more of like this mesh format with this titanol, with this titanol material, um, and it really makes this ski stiff. Big and burly over the edges in the sidewall here, and then nice and light in the middle for a little bit more compliance. But we marvel at these things and how stiff they are for how light they are. So they keep that material down, but you know, the overall build is incredibly stiff, uh, tip and tail. Um, you know, these things are holding on tight to any type of snow. Um, you talk about precision and responsiveness, like the M5 Mantra and the, the Bonafide. This thing right. is incredibly precise and incredibly responsive. And, you know, pretty low profile in the tip here as well, so that's going to give you a nice low swing weight. So not only is the light is the weight light, but also the swing weight. So it's a, you know, it's that combination that we're looking for. Pretty flat throughout the tail, so that's going to hold on tight to the turn. Um, but, you know, again, just a really interesting combination of stiffness and weight that we see in these Atomic Vantage skis. Um, kind of a similar feeling to what we're going to talk about with the core, yeah. is that they're making them light and stiff. Um, whereas some of the, those, that comparison of four that we just did was... Uh, heavy and stiff. <laughs> right, like that ski, I think it's it's fair to say it doesn't have the vibration damping of these four skis, right. but it's like quicker. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's arguably more agile because it's so light and so responsive. And we seem to see more lighter skiers gravitate to that as a result. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're in that market and you don't want the, the weight on your foot, um, this is a really strong option. Yeah, really cool ski. And, and again, it's just, it's really interesting to see the similarities and differences. Again, take the Kamex out, but the last five skis, they all are yeah. kind of designed along the same theme at least, yeah. but they, they all feel a little different. Um, and now with this next ski, I feel like we're breaking away from that trend that we've been in for the past five or six skis here. This kind of goes closer back to that first ski we looked at, that Kessley FX 96. This is the Tracer 98 from Armada, way, way lighter than like pretty much everything that we've talked about so far, except with, with a couple exceptions, um, but really, really light. It's designed much more for kind of off-piste, soft snow free ride mm -hmm. performance than Vantage 97, Bonafide, M5 Mantra, all those skis. Um, you see it in its rocker profile, longer tip rocker in this ski. A little bit longer tail rocker too than some of the skis we've looked at so far and you really feel it in the weight um, and also the flex pattern so this ski is pretty soft especially compared to these stiffer heavier metal skis but what's really cool about this is Armada has actually retained a good amount of vibration damping um, this ski like I, I use the word smooth a lot this is another ski that's very smooth. It's different than the Stokely in, in that smooth sense because it doesn't have the, the raw vibration damping at speed. But it's kind of one of those skis that feels like it has suspension. Like if you yeah. hit like a significant bump in the snow that you didn't notice, the tip just kind of like eats it up right. and, and keeps you on your line, you know, keeps you going in the direction that you want to be going rather than like getting deflected or bounced off things. Yeah. Um, so that really helps in variable snow conditions, which makes a lot of sense because this ski is designed for people that are probably going to at least take it into the woods, take it into off-piste terrain at their resort, 
and maybe you're putting a shift binding on here or a touring binding and, and using it as like a real backcountry tool. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have like the edge grip of the skis that we've looked at so far, but it's also not bad by any means. No, it's like, really energetic. Like, it's, yeah. I, I put it on the same lines with like the Canix as yeah. having that nice snap out of the turns. And very similar to the next ski that we're going to look yeah. at in, in, in a lot of ways, you know, that I think there are differences between those skis yeah. too. but. Yeah, this Tracer 98 is a great ski for if you're in this category, you want versatility, but you lean, like you as a skier, you value off-piste performance maneuverability more than just like the raw power of yeah. some of those other skis. Uh, but great ski from Armada. It's really cool what they're doing with directional skis these days yeah. instead, of just, instead of just producing a bunch of twin tips, um, which they still do really well too, which we'll see at the, the very end of this wall. Uh, now on to the Ripstick 96 from Elan. Um, this has a couple of changes for this year. Uh, we've seen it in the past and just really enjoy the playfulness and fun factor of these skis. And we've talked about that before. If we could use one, one word for Elan, specifically the Ripstick line. Yeah, it's fun. It's just fun. Um, they are light and easy to turn, but the more you put into them, the better response you get out of them. Yeah. So they have the carbon tubes still that run along the uh, sort of inside the sidewalls, um, and that's being used in that three-dimensional, 360-degree format. So it not only helps with torsional, fore-aft, but an infinite amount of yeah. um, ways of absorbing vibrations and providing energy to the ski. It's really cool. I don't think anybody else is, is using carbon that way. No. And since they are asymmetric, uh, we're, we do have a left and a right ski here, and so they're using their new carbon line technology to boost the inside edge. So this is a left ski, and you can kind of see this darker material here. Um, I believe it extends up a little further, but basically inhabits um, the inside edge of the ski, and it's just an additional sheet of, of carbon on it that gives that inside edge more strength, power, and grip. Um, so the, is more responsive than uh, the previous year's Ripstick 96s. Not as responsive as like the black version, which has yep. the full carbon layup, um, but they're kind of meeting in the middle between uh, the old 96 and the black with, uh, with this one here. Um, and then the Amphibio Rocker, you know, that's pretty unique too. So that left ski has the rocker on the outside edge and more camber on the inside edge, um, both tip and tail. So that's going to give you a smoother feel through the turn. It works both on hard snow and soft snow. So it doesn't hook. It just glides from turn to turn. Um, and it's interesting because they use that technology on all their skis, yeah. um, from their carvers to their floaters. So it does have applications in both hard and soft snow, which is pretty cool. Yeah, um, I love the way that those skis feel. Yeah. Um, I often think about the idea that they're probably a little bit better for a lighter weight skier. Um, you know, you're, you've skied them and I know yep. you, you have fun on them. Um, I just feel like I get like endless edge grip right. out of those skis while they're like a lot of, yeah. they're, they're very playful and fun. Um, it, it's, it's different than like the bulk of the skis over here that we talked about in its playfulness. But yeah, when I ski those, I I've never really feel like they're lacking edge grip no. maybe like raw stability at speed like i wouldn't just want to like straight line down like right. something gnarly on those skis where like bona fides mantras do that really well um, but yeah the edge grip on those skis is always something that that i'm i'm like pleasantly surprised or reminded by how good they are every time i ski yeah. them i mean i only really felt that limitation from here up. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, from here down on any of these ripstick skis, I've felt like it's totally compliant yep. and, and able to handle any type of aggressive skiing. Yeah. Um, just higher speeds when you're really pushing it, you know, this is, it, I mean, it is a little soft and light. And yep. that's that's part of the design. So it's not like it's a bad thing for the, the skier that that's intended for. Yeah, and good transition to this Core 93 because it's another ski that's pretty darn light and, and definitely designed with some off-piste soft snow performance mm -hmm. at, the, at the forefront of its focus. You know, I think these last three skis all fall into a similar category and really the next one too in the sense that they're, 
they're designed for people like 50 50 skiers you know yeah. skiers that like groomers they like to make turns on groomed trails but they're also they like going to the trees and the moguls if there's soft snow to be found chances are you're looking for some of it at yeah. least at one point in the day um and yeah this core 93 it's been around for a while now you know it, it feels like uh, it's it's kind of established its place in the in the ski world um a lot of times we talked about how similar it was in shape to the enforcers and i think that's still true the the 94 did change a little bit so the tip shapes are a little different now but it's got that versatile shape but it has a lighter feel so this construction is really unique they use caruba wood core which is really light kind of like bamboo and they use choroid graphene and carbon um, so materials that we don't typically see in ski construction and as Bob was saying about this vantage you get a lot of responsiveness when you create a ski that's this light and this stiff it's just it reacts yeah. to skier input really really quickly now what's different between this ski and the vantage is the rocker profile and the taper is much more significant in this core which makes it more forgiving for moguls mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a really, really good mogul ski. If you're kind of looking for specifically mogul performance, this is a really good one to choose. And just in general, you get more forgiveness and more maneuverability. Maybe not quite as much edge grip as a ski like the Vantage, um, but still really good too. Like they're, uh, we you know we talk about it a lot, but it's just amazing how stiff they make these skis. Yeah. So you still get a reasonable amount of power. I think a lot of people. When they think about the cores, they just like put them into this like lightweight maneuverability category, which isn't necessarily wrong, but you have to remember that they're pretty darn stiff too. Right. Yeah, it's not just a it's not just an intermediate ski because it's light. You no. know, it has that higher end feel um, because of, because of its stiffness, and you do need to uh, be prepared for that. You know, yeah. especially on the you know the uh, completion end of the turn. Yeah. Um, that it's gonna hold tight and it's going to shoot you into the next one so it's you know not just a drifty lightweight ski I no mean, it's got some performance behind it for sure and i would put this up on the list of the fun factor skis yeah absolutely uh, this is a fisher ranger 94 fr um <clears throat> we've talked about the 102 this is the narrower version and just you know another one of these stow skis you know these like east coast um, you know, one ski quiver type of skis with a, just no limitations for what it can do. Yeah, talk about good and moguls. Yep. Whew. Love this thing in bumps. Um, it is, it does have the carbon nose, so wood core with carbon starting here and going up through the tip. Um, so that the tip is actually pretty stiff, but it's also very light. Um, and has this long, really gradual rocker profile. And just like the thinnest yeah, thinnest construction you yeah. ever see. It really goes down to about nothing from here forward. So that's going to make this thing really swing weight um, on the light end of things. And then a nice thick vertical sidewall through the middle and then into more of a twin tip in the back. Um, so it does have that freestyle influence. Not a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, not a lot of, t of, you know, bump out. So this is going to actually allow you to complete your turn as you see fit. It's not going to lock you in the turn. No. So that's another nod to the playfulness of this ski. Um, but just, you know, from top to bottom, not a whole lot this thing can't do out there on the hill. Um, you know, and pretty light. Uh, you know, this is kind of falling into that category too if you want to do some touring. Uh, pretty good option. Just has that lightweight to it. Um, not terribly wide, so you don't need, you know, it's not going to feel like you're on something that is, you know, not appropriate for your conditions. Uh, this thing really has that all-mountain uh, feel to it, but just a ton of fun overall. Yeah, super fun. You know, we, we see a lot of these at Stowe, and a couple skiers choosing these as, as kind of like all-mountain freestyle skis, too, and going a little bit more forward yep. with the mount point, which I think is really interesting. It's not like a symmetrical twin tip by any means, but it is enough of a twin tip and it is kind of balanced enough that it actually works really well as a park ski too. Um, so yeah, a lot of different applications for this skiing. You could even put like a shift on here and, yep. and have a, a versatile touring ski. It also comes in a purple color. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's like they did with the with the Ranger 102, and really all of Fisher's skis is they don't have men's and women's skis anymore, so to speak. They're just like making skis and then making them in two different colors, right. which I think is is kind of cool. Uh, next up is a ski that, boy, I'm pretty darn familiar with, the Nordica Soul Rider 97. Uh, and I say that because I probably spend more time on this ski than any other ski in the world right now. Um, it's a great ski. I think the Soul Rider 97 gets overlooked a lot. Yep. Soul Rider line in general does. You know, I say that about Nordica's Navigator line a lot too. Just the success of the Enforcer collection. Often, like, people don't even realize that right. Nordica makes other skis. Yeah, you don't get past that page in the catalog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, which is fine, and I understand that because the enforcers are so good. But these Soul Riders have been along, around for quite a while now, and they, like, haven't changed at all because they're just good. Yeah. They're just, like, well-rounded, good ski. Um, now, there are some interesting things in this ski. Uh, it's pretty high camber. Yeah. Um, they use strips of carbon in here too, as well as a wood core. So with that high camber height and the carbon, you get like a, a really springy, responsive feel out of this ski. And also, which differs than pretty much every other twin tip on this wall, there's no early taper in this ski at all. So the tips and tails are really wide, um, which does a couple things. It, gives you a really long effective edge on firm snow so that's one of the reasons why I feel like it gets like really good edge grip and mm -hmm. really good like pop out of a carving turn I think it carves phenomenally well for what it is um, but you don't get like quite as much smeariness because you don't have that early taper there is tip and tail rocker but I do feel like when I take this into the woods it's not quite as easy as a ski like the Ranger 94 with this kind of more like torpedo shaped right. tail, you just get so much like so much s smeariness and the ability to pivot on a shape like this, where the Nordica is, it's kind of like giving you more edge grip and more feedback out of the ski, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, now, it would be silly for me not to mention this because this is how I use it. Nordic has two different mount points on here, a classic mount and a center mount. I use this as, as kind of like an all-mountain park ski. Put my bindings right on that center mount. Very, very balanced. You know, it's, it's not a symmetrical twin tip, but you can see just from me putting my hand on that, on that midpoint, the weight is, is pretty darn even from tip to tail. So a really good, really good park ski. Um, and yeah. just... Just a lot of fun for me because it lets me like rip around and, and make carving turns and not worry really about like skiing faster than the ski can handle. Yeah. But then it's got some playfulness too, and and I feel like I can take it into the woods without it being like too demanding. Right. No, there's a lot of a uh, lot of room for people to be on skis like this that you know just really want something fun and they can turn and carve and do whatever on. Yeah. And up next, we got a new ski from Rosignol. This is uh, part of their Black Ops line. This is the Escaper. Um, you know, I guess we would say this replaces the Sky 7. Yeah, that's how I like um, to think about it. And it's just a, it's a very different ski than the Sky 7. Yeah. Um, and so this is, you know, runs ni about 94 underfoot, depending on the length. And one of the things that I just noticed about this ski is that it has a longer turn radius as you get longer. So I think this length might be like the 16 meter um, in the 178, but when you bump up to like the 186 or 187, it gets up to about 22 meters. So it is a longer turning ski than that old Sky 7, yeah, which was, you know, had that short swing, uh, you know, proclivity. Um, this is a little bit different, more directional, um, you know, less of that tapered shape than the Sky 7 had, uh, but still like super light, very quick edge to edge. Um, still has that air tip that Rosignol's had, um, but more of just a straight up tail, you know, very much more directional oriented, a little bit of tail rocker, but not a ton. Um, and kind of stiff for its weight, especially not having any metal. So wood core and Diago fiber, so they're using that fiber to stiffen yep. up their skis. Kind of similar to the, the adaptive the mesh. adaptive and... mesh, yeah. And we see the Diago fiber on a bunch of the Rosignol skis for this year. So 
Um, that's kind of their new thing, making it stiff without adding uh, the weight of metal. Um, you know, not as stable as some of these more metallic skis, but for that skier that's really looking to, you know, get into the woods, make some quick turns, another great bump ski right here. Yep. Um, you know, very quick edge to edge and, uh, you know, just a ton of fun. So if you were a, a fan of that Sky 7 and the way that it could swivel, this still does that, just not quite the same amount of, you know, of that tail taper, uh, tip taper, sorry, and, you know, a little bit more of a directional tail. So they're emphasizing more on-trail performance uh, with this escaper, um, but still retaining that lightweight playfulness. Yeah, I think it was important for them not to, like, get too far away from what made that Sky 7 a good ski. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, I've said it before about the senders in comparison to the Soul 7. If you're riding a flatter ski, you still get a lot of, yeah. you know, the, the pivoting forgiveness for, for trees and, and softer snow and stuff like that. You just get a longer effective edge now. It's yeah. kind of like they're kind of using like the enforcer recipe and in, in the shaping concept in the sense that like the higher your edge angle, the longer your effective edge is going to be, which kind of lets you lets you choose between pivoting turns and then more like carvy yeah. carvy turns. It's pretty smooth for for its weight, that's for sure. Yep. Um, next we have the Origin 96 from Liberty. Uh, this is just a classic Liberty ski in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm thinking back to a test day that we had on this. I don't think it was this past year. It might have been the year before. But regardless, the ski hasn't changed since then. And I just remember having so much fun just bouncing and playing on this ski through the relatively tight trees at Stowe. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really fun ski. It, it's pretty light. You know, Liberty skis are generally pretty light. They use a combination of bamboo and then some other wood. Um, but pretty much all their skis have some bamboo in them, which makes them really light. And then there's also carbon fiber in this ski, too. So, you, you know, you get a ton of springy responsiveness, a lot like that Soul 7. But the difference with this ski is the shape is a lot different. You know, so when I was talking about that Soul 7 and how the tips and tails are really wide, it doesn't use any taper at all, there's quite a bit of taper in this tail yeah. shape, um, which, which kind of corresponds to that rocker profile. And that just gives it such a fun, easy, playful feel. Yeah. Um, super, super fun in trees, super fun in moguls, really forgiving. I think this shape is one of the most forgiving shapes up here. It's pretty similar to that Ranger 94 in that sense. Like, it's never going to feel like it's locking you into a turn. It pretty much lets you do whatever you decide to do as a skier. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's just it's a lot of fun. And I think... The thing that surprised me most about it, you know, just looking at this shape and f picking it up, I knew it was going to be fun and playful, um, but you actually get surprisingly good edge grip out of the ski too. Like I had a lot of fun. Similarly to how I find the Soul 7 to be, or the, the Soul Rider to be very rewarding making carving turns, this is too. It, it's snappy and, and responsive and it just feels like it's kind of like popping you into the next turn and giving you that like weightless feel in yep. between carves which is like one of the best feelings you can get on on snow um, now it doesn't nearly have the edge grip or the vibration damping or the stability at speed of skis like these over here on the left um, but yeah it's just like light and fun and playful and it holds an edge pretty yeah. darn well and the bamboo is an interesting wood you know it's it's quieter than some of these other woods yeah. that we see and so, you know, Liberty kind of has the market on, has cornered the market on that and using the bamboo and having their skis have this quiet personality to them. Um, and this has a surprisingly responsive tail. Yeah. I found that it's a little bit different. You know, that tip is more floaty and playful and the tail is surprisingly responsive, um, which is great, you know, and it gives you kind of that uh, best of both worlds type of scenario. So. When you're in the soft snow, it's going to float up and be playful. And when you want to snap out a couple of quick turns, then it does that too. Um, so all for not having metal and being in a light and fun package, I mean, they do a nice job with that. Yeah, there's uh, we shot some like slow-mo footage on this ski where you can like really see yeah. how it flexes. And yeah, the, the, you get a lot of you got a lot of nice compliance yeah. out of that out of that tip flex. 
Next up, nice lightweight ski from Vocal. This is a Blaze 94. Uh, this is a new ski for this year, and uh, you know, kind of like the you know the replacement talk with this. Uh, this is kind of taking over the spot where the 98 used to be. Yeah. Uh, a little <laughs> bit narrower, definitely a, like a way different build, but it's kind of occupying that spot in the catalog. Yeah, and it, it's just better. <laughs> just, it's just for that category of ski, not to take anything away from those 98s, and I actually was a big fan of the 108, yeah. uh, and that ski was like weirdly unique with its its rocker profile or lack yeah. of camber, um, but yeah, I just feel like these, sorry to cut you off there, That's but I okay. just feel like they did a good job with these Blaze skis, yeah. and, and just made a better ski for that category. So they got the 94. I'll just drink my coffee now. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> they got the 94 and the 106. Um, so obviously on the narrower end, it is lighter overall because there's less material. Um, using uh, Vocal's kind of new like hybrid wood core here, yeah. um, it's a little bit lighter and they're using rubber for the tips and the tails to help dampen the vibrations. Because a ski that's just light like this is going to, it's going to have some vibration issues on harder snow. And so they're doing a nice job by, you know, taking care of that. Yeah, um, really cool combination of materials in that yeah. ski. And, you know, not the softest and not the stiffest, just kind of right in the middle here. Um, definitely kind of using this as their uh, model of what to put a 50-50 resort touring yeah, absolutely. binding on. Yep. Um, and, you know, if you saw Jeff's video on the intro to Alpine touring and backcountry stuff, um, th you know, this is this is kind of where they're going with that with that is that you can use this ski in the resort, out of bounds, wherever you want. Yeah, like get a Lupo 120 and a Duke PT-12 and yep. a Blaze and like you're, right. you're good to go. And they make like Blaze 94 skins. Right, you exactly. Know, so it's, you know, the, these companies are doing a nice job of making, a, you know, this cohesive package of, um, you know, products that are yeah. supposed to be used together um, and, you know, just makes it more harmonious of a setup. Yep. But, um, light, snappy, easy to use, you know, definitely I would put it up with this Rosignol here as, you know, kind of that similar comparison um, of that lighter ski that has good snap to it. Yeah. I, what I, another thing I really like about the Blaze is how they use that partial metal laminate underfoot. Yep. Um, and they also have the, the 3D radius in that ski. Yep. So what happens, and I think it's probably like... I think there's benefits to just being a lighter skier sometimes, <laughs> but like that ski, when I like really power it up in the forebody of the ski and engage that that mid like the mid portion yep. of the ski where the metal is, you actually get like some pretty impressive carves out yeah. of it too. And like you can it, see that it holds metal. an edge reasonably well, um, while yeah, still yeah. being really light. And I just think it's really cool that the way that they let you play with different turn shapes in those blaze skis with the with the 3D radius. Uh, next up is the Menace 98 from Dina Star. Um, a couple weeks ago, or maybe last week, or something, somebody left a comment on one of our videos and said, "That's just the holy shred, right?" And I, I actually had to take a moment to be like, "Wait, is it?" And it's not. Um, now the the Black Ops Holy Shred from Rosnell, we talked about that in the 100 comparison. This ski from Dina Star is very similar. You know, Rosnell and Dina Star are sister companies, so to speak. The shape of this thing, like when you hold it up to the the Black Ops Holy Shred, they look really yeah. similar. Um, I do think this Menace 98 is a little lighter, and I think it's a little softer flexing too, which which is really nice to have between those two skis, as you can kind of focus on which one makes more sense for you. Um, I have a blast on this ski. You know, I think it's, its shape makes it a little bit more versatile than something like that, that Soul Rider. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a little bit, just a different style of rocker and taper in the tips and tails. And they also do this kind of like step down core sidewall thing where you get a thinner profile through the tail than you do and through the tip as well than through the mid body of the ski. Um, which really changes its flex pattern. So you can't really see the tail right now, um, but you get a lot of flex out of this tail, yeah. which is just really fun. And it does a couple things. It makes edge release really, really easy. And it also makes it easy to do things like ollieing and like, 
skiers like to do wheelies now, which I think is weird because it's just like you're just in the back seat. Right. Uh, but it does that too. Um, and in general, what I'm trying to say is it just, it lets you do kind of unique things and it lets you play. It lets you kind of leave your signature on the mountain. And it will still carve, it still holds an edge. I actually think it feels really smooth. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's playfulness and it's versatility are, are off the charts. Um, and I think, it, yeah, to go back to that, that holy shred, I think it's a, a very similar ski, but I think it's cool that between Rosingal and Dina Star, you can kind of just focus on like weight and flex pattern right. between those two skis. I know you're a big fan of, of the Menace 98. Yeah, and I skied the Slicer, which was the previous iteration of this for years, um, in a Telemark application. So I would put this, give this a big nod for a, a good Telemark option, if, if anyone ever does that anymore. Um, if that's a thing. If that's a thing. Um, longer turn radius on this, too. So this one is the 181. Um, and it's 23 meters, and they also make a 187, which I think bumps it up to like 26 meters on yeah. the turn radius. So pretty straight cut to these skis. Puts more input into onto the feet of the skier to determine the turn shape and duration. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why I liked it for a Telemark ski is that it didn't lock you into a turn. Yeah. You could drift really well on these things. Yeah, and in general, when you see a ski with a, a bigger turn radius, it generally means easier edge release. Uh, we had a nice conversation about these before the video. Uh, this is a K2 Poacher. Um, you know, a again, like this wider park ski, this wider twin tip uh, that just has a lot of applications for all mountain use. Um, so K2's version is the Poacher. Um, one of the things that sets this apart is the triaxial braiding, which actually gives it a little bit of weight to it. Yep. So they are similar to how Kessley uh, uses that fiberglass sock. Uh, they do K2's version, which is more of a braiding. Um, and the reason that that adds weight is because they use epoxy, and epoxy is a heavier material. I'll actually throw in a quick clip of some triaxial braiding. I love the video. Uh, I, don't, I think K2 braiding. will be okay with us throwing that in there. Uh, but just a really nice even flex and like significantly more taper um, early taper in the poacher than either the menace or the soul rider yep. in terms of the twin tips and their um, and their taper. Yeah. So you know this ski is at its widest part here, whereas these are further up towards the tips, um, and that's going to give you a little bit better flotation and softer snow, um, and just. It, it makes that shorter um, effective edge with the increased taper. So a little bit of a different feel um, versus either yeah, of these like two skis. Yeah, and like in a park application, that also means, and in general, it's less catchy. Yep. So like this is getting into like pretty detailed stuff, but like a switch spinning takeoff is going to be easier on the poacher. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like the one thing on that Soul Rider that like is pretty can be challenging is taking off switch because the tip is so big because there's that taper it just there, there's less the ski is just not going to catch as often yeah um, which to me just gives it a more confidence inspiring feel yeah and a little bit of an easier going feel in in a park application uh but 96 millimeters underfoot on this one so a little you know just a, a tad narrower than the other uh twin tips we have on the list here um, and just, you know, a nice solid overall feel. Yeah. Um, kind of has that uh, more all mountain, more free ride aspect to it. And it's also interesting that K2 doesn't have much else to compare it to. Their Mindbender series goes from a 90 to a 99. So this is like their, their stop gap. It's their their mid 90s ski. Mid 90s. Um, so just a, you know, really awesome uh, application for both park and all mountain stuff. Yeah, super fun. I made Bob watch like four minutes of Colby Stevenson at the 2020 X Games before we filmed this video. I mean, uh, if you can win the X Games on that ski, then it's got to be pretty good at the park. Right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the last ski we're going to talk about is the ARV96 from Armada. So, you know, we've talked about a lot of twin tips so far, and we've talked about kind of how they... They can lean more towards all mountain use, you know, if, if you're feeling like 
like you're more you're not really a park skier but you still like a twin tip there's a lot of good options up here i think this is probably the best option if you're actually spending more time or most of your time in the terrain park yeah. this is one of the most balanced skis you know my hand again is right here on the freestyle recommended mount point which is just about exactly true center in fact i'm sure it is and it is very very balanced a little bit more weight in the tip than the tail but not much and then even the factory recommended line and that's and this is one of the reasons why i'm kind of giving it that title of like one of the best in the park the factory recommended line or a more traditional line is not that far back yeah. either um, so whether you're going center or factory recommended, this is going to feel more symmetrical than like pretty much anything that we've talked about so far with maybe the soul rider and the poacher being right there with it. Um, not like a, a stiff flex pattern at all, but supportive so you can land big jumps and stuff like that. Um, and then enough rocker and taper in this ski that again, it's not going to be catchy, kind of like what I was just saying about the poacher really easy takeoffs, really easy ollies and nollies and stuff like that. It's really like thinking about the modern park skier and, and giving them a tool for what they want to do. And in general, the modern park skier right now is also kind of looking for a wider ski, mm -hmm. something that they can ski around the rest of the mountain. You know, you're not, it's not like a, a super narrow, full camber, like competition park ski. This is a more versatile ski that you can take Take around the rest of the mountain too, you know, it's not going to carve like a bona fide. it's not going to really play in trees like a ripstick, but it's just a very well-rounded yep. ski. Um, and, and, you know, the last, the last few skis here that we're talking about are all in the 499 range. Yeah, good value. Which, yeah, the va I mean, the, the value there is, is just, it's really impressive. Um, I also really like the way that Armada does their step sidewalls. So you get the most sidewall underfoot, and then like, I'd call it like a third or even like quarter sidewall yeah. through the forebody of the ski and then nothing in the tips. So it's kind of like really playing around with where the torsional stiffness is in the ski, which makes a lot of sense. Like in a ski like this, you don't want a lot of torsional stiffness up there in the right. tip, because then you would just, you, it would feel like the ski was fighting you in the park or in the trees or anything like yeah. that. And the same with the swing lane, as they're getting, removing vertical sidewall, getting to the tips and tails, it's just getting spinnier. Yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lighter and more apt to spin and go side to side, uh, tips and tails. Yep. But yeah, really fun ski from Armada, you know, when you're just wanting to do a little bit of everything out there from park and pipe to all mountain skiing. I mean, there's just a very playful ski right here. Yep. Nice and snappy. Yeah, and, and very similar in a lot of ways to the poacher that we just finished yep. with. So that's it. That's our comparison of these 20, 2021 mid-90 all-mountain skis. Um, as always, let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to talk more about the differences and similarities between these skis. Like I said at the beginning, we will be doing a few more 2021 ski comparisons. Next week, we're going to go back to women's. Um, similar category but a little bit wider and then yeah we'll, we'll keep going and hopefully the temperatures start dropping here in Stowe and we'll be back on snow within a couple of weeks and then we'll yeah we'll have some new on snow content to share with you uh, we'll start start testing skis again and, and doing all that fun stuff so look out for that we're looking forward to that yep definitely. Um, and we'll talk to you soon bye